great to be here with all of you. I wish it could be in person. Um, last year, it was in person. Uh, last year, around this time, I was at Niket Bay with a lot of you, actually. We were doing our field naturalist field walk at Niket Nik uh, Bay and looking at flowers um, and that sort of thing. And I actually, I played sort of a, a mean trick, maybe, on one of my botanist friends. I, I found a, a bloodroot flower and a trillium flower growing right next to each other. And I moved the bloodroot flower on top of the trillium's leaves. And I took a picture and I started asking people, you know, what, what flower do you think this is? And, uh, well, nobody got it right. And they gave a lot of very precise but inaccurate answers in that. That was fun. And unfortunately, I can't be out in the woods joking around with you um, this time, this spring. And instead of spending time with people, I've, I've found myself spending a lot more time in the natural world, being quiet. Um, I've learned more birds this spring than I've ever learned before. I just learned a new one today, a white crowned sparrow. Um, I've also learned more insects and trees than I have in a little while. Um, this tree is a, it's a hackberry tree, which I never knew was a native tree in this area, but it's growing all around Burlington. And that little tank looking insect is actually the larva of a firefly. Um, and I just learned that three days ago or something like that. And I thought that was wild. I've also been doing a lot of foraging um, nettles and that sort of thing. And actually, I was just in the interview before this, and I saw two women carrying huge bags of nettles. Um, and that's been meaningful to me. It, it strikes me that uh, so I've I've kind of gone through a few stages of learning about the natural world. Uh, in college, I, I took botany for the first time, and it felt like my eyes were open to the, the depth of um, the diversity of life around me for the first time. And then just this spring, I feel that uh, sense of community with the natural world increase again. Um, and I guess maybe that'll happen the rest of my life. I'm not sure. But this newfound sense of community with the natural world also brings into sharp focus the, the destruction that humans are causing on the natural world. Um, and lately, scientists have gotten better than ever at describing just how destructive humans are on the rest of life on Earth. I'm sure you've all heard a lot of these headlines, but uh, since 1970, 30% of the U.S. bird population has disappeared. Three billion birds have have um, disappeared from our landscape. Um, the insects that those birds rely upon are also in great decline. 40% uh, of insect species worldwide are in decline, and a third of all insect species are facing extinction. Um, and, and this next finding I find really shocking that even in protected areas, places that uh, people aren't going in and turning into crops or paving over, but protected natural areas, insect biomass has been declining um, in Germany by 76% in the last 27 years. And that's pretty frightening, I think. Um, another way of looking at it, uh, uh, wild mammals currently make up only about 4% of the mammal biomass on Earth, and the rest of it is humans and livestock. Um, and I think that sort of sort of shatters the fantasy that I've had that that there's still ample wilderness out there and you know things are bad but we still we still have some um, pristine places there's not much left um, since the dawn of, of human civilization we've actually lost 50 percent of all vegetation on earth and and also 50 percent of all life um, and that's the only life we know of in the universe so uh, sort of the, the grandmother report of all of these is a, is a recent report out by the IPBES, which is a um, big international intergovernmental uh, group, and they're telling us that one million species are facing extinction right now, many of them within the coming decades. Um, and, and in the past hundred years, there's been a lot of really good conservation work. Um, people have been setting aside reserves and doing other sorts of things, but even with that, if we continue on the trajectory of the conservation we've been doing, we're going to face these extinctions. And unless there's transformative change across um, political, economic, social, and technological realms, um, we're going to see these species extinctions, many of them within, within our lifetimes. Um, and this, this gets at kind of the heart of why I decided to be a field naturalist for a long time. I had felt um, a lot of sadness about the destruction of the natural world that's going on around us, but also sort of helpless about it. I didn't really know what we could do. Um, and before I started the Field Naturalist program, I decided, well, I want to find out what we can do. And I'm going to try to learn. Um, 
This is a good time to talk about exactly why does biodiversity matter and, and what is the, the value of nature. Um, this is important for, for the IPBES and governments and that sort of thing because they're trying to create policy to protect, protect nature. Um, and it's been a focus of um, my studies, actually. It's been a question I've been mulling over for the past year, longer, but a lot over the past year. Traditionally, people have made two arguments for the value of nature. One, that, that nature is valuable in its own right, has nothing to do with humans. Um, and that's a powerful argument. And the other argument is, has been that nature is valuable because it does things for humans, um, which is also another powerful argument. We all want our crops to be pollinated. We all want timber for, for paper and we want clean water and clean air. Um, and oftentimes instrumental values are, are um, spoken about in monetary terms, a certain dollar amount of value that ecosystems provide for us. And these two are powerful arguments, but as the last slide showed, they're failing so far. Um, if we keep using just these arguments, keep doing what we're doing, um, we're going to lose species, which, which I think is unacceptable. Um, and, and that brings up um, a, th a third type of value framework that, that social scientists have um, successfully introduced into the IPBES um, to try to capture uh, a new way of understanding the value of nature. Um, it's not really a new way of understanding. It's people have valued nature this this way forever, but it's a new um, framework for understanding, I guess. Um, and relational values are preferences, principles, and virtues that are associated with relationships, which is sort of an esoteric, hard concept to wrap your mind around. Um, uh, but I think the best way to describe them is through an example. And I think really importantly, um, the most important thing maybe about relational values is that they're non-substitutable. And we understand this um, pretty inherently with human to human relationships. Um, for example, imagine if you had a brother you loved and for some of you that might be easy. Uh, for me, it's easy. Um, if somebody said, okay, I'm gonna take your brother and take him to somewhere else in the world and you can't see him again, but he's gonna be okay. And I'm gonna give you somebody else that's gonna be your new brother and he's just as, as kind and funny. Um, so you're gonna be okay. I would be like, what? No, you can't, you can't substitute my brother like that. Um, the value isn't really in what, what he gives to me, what he provides for me or really for his um, well-being either. It's, it's something that's found in the relationship that's been between us that um, we've built um, since our childhood. All, you can't really replace those memories and replace um, uh, the growing that you've done together with somebody else. And many people feel the same way about the natural world. We don't talk about it that much, um, but, but people have done studies, preliminary studies in parts of the world like uh, uh, Colombia, where they ask people, why is this river important to you? And I think about 92% of respondents mentioned relational values 38% um, uh, responded with instrumental values, so it's important for economic reasons. And only 2% two two of respondents responded with intrinsic values. Um, and if, if we bring this framework into our conservation efforts, we're going to be able to better understand why people value the nature that they're a part of, and so better conserve it, um, conserve those values. Uh, and it's also going to allow us to um, conserve nature with people instead of forcing them to be conserved, you know, s setting aside parks and not letting people in and that sort of thing. Um, so the biodiversity crisis is upon us and um, famous uh, scientist E.O. Wilson has been saying for a long time um, that that we need to start doing something different and and he has said that if we're serious about conserving biodiversity, if we want to safeguard at least 85% of the species on Earth, we have to protect um, and dedicate half the Earth to nature um, in some way. And it's a pretty simple concept. If you conserve less than 50% of the of the Earth, you're going to, or protect it in some way, you're going to lose more species. Pardon me. Um, and if we, well, it's going to be hard to conserve more, but I think 50% is sort of a, a safe zone that that E.O. Wilson thinks is, is acceptable. And this idea is based off of uh, the concept of island biogeography. Um, and there's a phenomenon among islands that the bigger an island is, the, the greater species it can support. 
Um, and also the closer to the mainland it is, the more species it can support compared to smaller islands. And this is because um, smaller islands have fewer niches, but also the populations of all the different species are smaller on those islands, smaller on smaller islands. And so just through stochastic weather events and other things like that, it's going to be more likely that uh, uh, species goes into local extinction on small islands compared to a large island. And it's going to be harder for new species to colonize that island again. Um, and that is easy to see if you look at the United States um, from a plane that, that this concept of island biogeography also applies to terrestrial ecosystems. Um, this is a, a picture I took out of my airplane window the over spring break. I flew from Montreal to British Columbia with my girlfriend because we're going to move there after I graduate. And um, I noticed that when we were flying over that uh, over the Midwest that we actually flew over my house in Appleton, Wisconsin, my childhood home. Um, and you can't obviously see the house, but you can see the street it's on from this picture. Um, and uh, it was it was an interesting coincidence, but it, I was really thinking about habitat fragmentation at the time and thought, oh, what a perfect picture to describe that. Um, so all the white spaces are farm fields um, covered in snow. And the, the dark spaces, those little squares, are woodlots at the, in the corners of farm fields. Um, and they're small. They're probably, you know, 20 acres at maximum, something like that. And um, this shrinking of woodlots has been going on ever since um, people have, or uh, colonists have come to Wisconsin. But you can, and they're getting smaller. And you can imagine that in one of these small patches of forest that if you were a box turtle, um, you might not have a population large enough to sustain um, to sustain population through generations, a breeding population. And so in one of these small patches, it'd be pretty easy for a box turtle to go locally extinct. And then um, farm fields and roads are huge barriers for turtles. And so and there aren't really any large habitats nearby. And so pretty soon you're going to have local extinction of box turtles and they're never going to come back. Um, and this is this is happening at a larger scale with our national parks. They seem pretty large, um, but they're only small islands compared to the original ecosystems. And if we just conserve all our national parks, we're definitely going to lose more than 80 or more than 15 percent of species on Earth. Um, so a couple of years ago, there was a group of Vermonters who um, went down to New York City and heard E.O. Wilson speak, and they were inspired by his message and his call for um, protecting half the earth if we are serious about protecting conserving biodiversity on the planet um, and they came back and uh, they were one of our uh, they ended up being my project sponsor um, they had a proposal for a project to help them with their goals of uh, accelerating biodiversity conservation in vermont and bringing the half earth vision here to vermont and i was immediately uh, extremely excited about the opportunity to work with them because um, I've been really wondering about global biodiversity conservation for a long time, but feeling hopeless or helpless. And then here comes this group that that brings both a solution and the dedication to try to try to um, try to work on this problem at the scale that I think it deserves, which is you know half the earth. Um, and my role with them uh, has been to help them with these with these goals. Uh, it wasn't a very defined role at the beginning, and I sort of had the, the luxury and the freedom to figure out what I thought with with their guidance um, to be the most important thing for me to do with my with this project opportunity. So when I started working with them, um, I decided I started talking to local conservation experts, people at Vermont Fish and Wildlife and the Land Trust, Vermont Land Trust, um, Liz Thompson and Bob Sano and Eric Sorensen and others. And I asked them, uh, what is the most important thing right now in moving biodiversity conservation forward in Vermont? Which is sort of a general question, but I, I thought I'd go with it. Um, and it, I found out that there's already a plan in Vermont to protect biodiversity. It's a recent plan. I think it's it came out in just the past few years, certainly within the past five years. Um, and it was led by the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. And it was made to answer the question, if we want to conserve all the biodiversity, all the species in Vermont now and into an uncertain future, uh, what places do we have to conserve and, and, and what do we have to do? Um, and to answer that question, they followed the course filter approach to biodiversity conservation. 
which essentially the idea behind that is that there's about 20,000 or more species in Vermont and to create a conservation plan for each of them would be overwhelming and impossible. Um, and so instead of trying to conserve each species one by one, you come up or you, you figure out which landscape and habitat features um, represent the needs of most of the species. You conserve those or you try to anyway, and then you figure out which species fall through the cracks and, and come up with individual plans for them. Um, so you can see the Vermont conservation design over here on the right, and there's a bunch of different colors, and, and the green ones are called um, interior forest blocks, and these are large interior forest patches that aren't fragmented currently, um, and they uh, provide the needs of certain species that need large ranges like moose and bear um, and, and others, someday maybe cougars, who knows. Um, and if you conserve those, you conserve the species that need them, but you also conserve a lot of incidental species that that just rely upon um, uh, maybe northern hardwoods, forests, other things like that, but don't necessarily need large blocks. But you're starting to conserve more and more species. And then um, they added on to that the physical landscape diversity blocks, which are the purple blocks. And these are areas that are either rare natural communities that aren't represented by the large interior forest blocks or they're um, parts of soil are represent areas on top of rare and unique soils and bedrocks that have rare species on them. Um, and then uh, that conserves a, another large chunk of, of biodiversity of species within the state. And then they also mapped all the riparian areas and wetlands. Um, that's shown in blue. And then the last and maybe sort of linchpin or crucial part of the conservation plan are these orange blocks, which are called um, connectivity blocks. And these connect all the different portions of our uh, habitat features and, and blocks together. Um, and the idea is behind this is, well, one, we need gene flow if we want to continue to have healthy uh, populations of plants and animals. But two, as the climate changes, plants and animals are going to have to shift their ranges to find new suitable habitat. And um, if there's a road in the way or a lot of roads and a lot of development plants and animals aren't going to be able to move and so they're going to just die in place before finding a new place to live. Um, so altogether that makes up Vermont conservation design. There's a lot more to it um, and it's highly sophisticated but one of the really cool features of it is that it maps every location in Vermont. Um, there's an online mapping tool called BioFinder that does that and then if you click on an area it also pulls up the management guidelines for that area. Um, things that you should consider if you want to keep ecosystem function in that area. Um, so maybe in a large interior forest block, uh, you can go hunting and you can do sustainable logging as long as um, you're not in a particularly sensitive place or as long as you're not in an old growth um, uh, zone or something like that. Um, and maybe you could even develop on the edges, but if you develop in the middle, you're gonna compromise their ecological integrity. And especially in a uh, connectivity block. If you start developing through the middle of those, you're going to cut off habitat chunks from each other and and sort of doom the creatures inside to eventual um, extinction, or at least some of them. Um, so I learned about this great tool, um, which was it was uh, a revelation to me to to understand finally how people conserve biodiversity at a large scale. And what I learned is that this tool exists. We have the knowledge in Vermont to conserve um, most of our species. Um, but the tool from conservation design isn't what well known by people yet and people don't really care about it as as much as we need them to um, and it isn't used very much even though it has all this great potential and so it seemed like the best thing for me to do with my project was to figure out a way to to try to change those to engage people and teach them about mountain conservation design along with other conservation tools and so I decided well I want to teach people about biodiversity conservation, but um, it's not necessarily the most engaging topic if it's just given in a dry scientific form. And so I thought it would be a good idea to try to, to tell stories about humans um, and their relationship with the environment, or humans and their relationship with other, with other people as mediated by the environment. And so I went around and, and found people in Vermont and interviewed them. And um, took pictures on their land and that sort of thing and wrote these stories um, that are designed to be engaging and 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 draw people in so that they want to keep reading and want to learn about um, conservation topics 
and, and be inspirational and inspire people to act. But then crucially, I think, provide the tools so that, that if people want to act to create, to conserve biodiversity, they know what they can do um, and sort of do that to undermine the, the feeling of helplessness that I think stops a lot of conservation action, not really understanding what to do. So I did um, about 16 interviews throughout the, the Winooski watershed. We chose the watershed just to keep it into a small area and to highlight um, all the richness of life in small areas. So it doesn't seem like conservation is something that's happening somewhere else. Um, and also I reached out to as many different kinds of people as I could using um, talking to local conservation groups and, and farm groups and foresters and two different Abenaki communities. Um, and the idea there was that I wanted to, to showcase relationships with the land that um, as many people as possible could relate to, to find something that, that they could relate to. Um, and those are the uh, represented farmers and hunters and all sorts of things. Um, and then Rochelle, my advisor, and I designed uh, questions for these interviews and came up with a standardized protocol. Um, and we designed them so that we could use them in relational values research, which is ongoing right now, but I won't talk about too much in this talk. Um, I, I also designed them to elicit emotional answers from people. And I sort of was suspecting that a lot of us um, have our own way of relating with the environment and care deeply, but we don't necessarily talk about it all that much or have an opportunity to talk about it. So I wanted to bring those sorts of feelings out um, so that I could use them to create compelling stories. Um, and the sort of questions I asked were like this, how would you describe your relationship to the land here? Uh, to the degree that you care about other organisms on Earth, could you explain to me why? What would you like me or other people to understand about this place? And if a land could talk, what would you say? And there was there was loads more questions, and I think 10, 16 questions in total. Um, I also asked people to take me to the places on their property or in the area that were the most meaningful to them and explain to me and that sort of thing. And then after we were done talking, I would go around and photograph the places that they, they showed to me and also um, other um, things that I thought were maybe beautiful or potentially useful for teaching conservation contact, uh, topics. Um, so I learned a lot from, from these interviews, but uh, I'll tell you about just two things now, two, two big things that I learned. One, everybody um, that I interviewed, well, for one thing, everybody that I interviewed responded to my requests. And so they all had one thing in common in that they um, were sympathetic to the idea of conservation in at least some way. Um, but something I found out is that the people who did the most to protect biodiversity on their land had two things. They One, they had an explicit relationship with nature. Um, and maybe that's obvious, but it looked like a lot of different things. Uh, a good example is this, this person I interviewed, and he grew up in Richmond on a dairy farm and was a dairy farmer for a while, um, and then stopped because he couldn't make any money. Um, and then uh, when I interviewed him, I asked him, you know, what does your relationship to the other organisms on Earth look, look like? And he stared back at me like I was speaking French or some language he didn't understand. Um, but then he started talking and, and he conveyed this incredible passion and, and admiration for white-tailed deer. He thinks that they're uh, the most beautiful creatures on Earth and incredibly graceful and admires their ability to survive in all sorts of different conditions. Um, and so he really did have a relationship with other organisms. He just had to be asked about it. Um, and so what he did is he subdivided his land and developed part of it and used the money to conserve the rest of it. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing I noticed that people who do the most protect biodiversity on their land have land ownership. And that's also maybe an obvious point, but it, it speaks to, um, I think, some important issues. Uh, Everybody derives benefit from natural places. Um, a natural environment is sort of the birthright of all of us. Uh, we all use clean air and that sort of thing and, and, and love natural places for different reasons. But we don't all have the same power to protect it. Um, something that I thought uh, was really interesting is this past fall, I went to a hunter safety course because um, I wanted to start deer hunting and they explained something, the game warden explained something, that poaching is illegal because the wildlife of Vermont are owned by the government and owned by the public. So when people poach, they're stealing a public asset from you. And I thought, um, 
wouldn't it be interesting if if water and clean air and other things like that pollination services uh, were also considered public assets and and we all um, had the responsibility to steward them um, and we're going to have to steward them on private land because in Vermont I think 80 percent of the land is private and that's actually true across the U.S. as well. Um, so I I wrote all these different stories and and I use each story to display um, different relationships to the environment and also different uh, conservation concepts. Um, some of the stories talked about nature's importance to to children to growing up in in beautiful places and interesting places. Others talked about um, how a loss of nature is is the same as a loss of heritage or um, management and extraction of resources isn't just um, an extractive process, but it can also be a, an active care for the land and and people can derive meaning from that sort of active care. Many of the people I interviewed um, talked about a sense of companionship with nature or partnership with nature or different parts of nature. Um, and others talked about nature not as a source of community for them between them and nature, but as a foundation for community uh, between people. So um, people uh, build community with each other by being in beautiful natural places and being well, so being able to exercise or walk and, and do these things together. Um, I also talked about different conservation topic concepts. Um, I talked about the importance of wetlands, the, the link between climate change and biodiversity loss, um, how we need to balance reserves and managed areas if we want to be able to protect biodiversity and also continue using resources from from natural areas. Um, I also explained some of the basics of biodiversity conservation, how if we want to conserve a diversity of species, what we really have to do is conserve a diversity of habitats. Um, I also just um, talked about some some more practical things like conservation easements and that sort of thing. Um, so I wrote all those stories and then I wrote one more story that wasn't from the perspective of, of any one person, but was my attempt at consolidating all the different information um, and relationships that I showed in the other stories, put them all in one place. And I wanted to give create a place where people could read about biodiversity and understand what they could do at all of the different scales um, from from the half yard to conserving biodiversity in our in our private land to the town, to the state, and um, across the earth, eventually. Um, and I, I started it by saying that uh, biodiversity conservation starts with developing our own personal relationships with nature, because the personal relationship with nature is what will sustain the energy needed to um, continue wanting to learn about what nature needs to be healthy, what species need to, to persist, and also the energy needed to continue um, being motivated to try to protect it. Um, so at each of these different scales, I explained how uh, biodiversity uh, could be protected. And I really wanted to give people specific things they could do at the, at the yard scale. Um, I, I think it's really important to plant species that, species of plants that support insects and support food webs in that way. And the town scale, the town scale is one of the most important or powerful scales in Vermont for protecting biodiversity because uh, towns which are um, run by citizens here in Vermont can use Vermont conservation design to create zoning laws and zoning regulations. Um, and that's going to be, I think, the most important way going forward in Vermont for conserving biodiversity. I also talked about things that people can do at the state scale. Um, and importantly, what people can do at the national and international scale, because if we don't put pressure on our politicians to prioritize biodiversity conservation, if we just keep on going as business uh, going on as business as usual, we're definitely going to lose this this effort to conserve biodiversity. So how will these stories be used and why are they important? Um, I think they're important because uh, I really explicitly tried to combine emotional engagement with um, knowledge and empowerment to take effective action um, to try to remedy maybe the thing that I was feeling before myself where I felt uh, inspired that I wanted to do something to protect biodiversity, but I didn't know what I could do and so I did nothing. Um, 
And these these stories are really designed to be tools for local conservation organizations and and schools. Um, the Vermont Half Earth Alliance is using them, and we we work with a lot of teachers. And there's already teachers that are showed a lot of interest in the stories and and are going to use them for for the students next year in teaching about biodiversity conservation. Um, I've reached out to many different local and and national. Um, conservation organizations and already the stories have been featured by the North Branch Nature Center and the Vermont Natural Resources Council and I just started sending emails out a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago and already um, the stories have been viewed about a thousand times, over a thousand times and I'm also in talks with uh, other organizations who have shown interest and are committed to to uh, featuring these stories like the Vermont Land Trust and Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, the Northeast Wilderness Trust and Forest Stewards Guild and the E.O. Wilson Initiative. Uh, going forward, I'm going to keep trying to spread these stories and I'm going to keep trying to incorporate these concepts into all the work that I do. Um, but right now I'm still working with my advisor Rochelle Gold to um, to do social science analysis of of the interviews um, we're looking we're interested in how re relational values are expressed by people when they're explicitly asked about their values because relational values are such a new concept that there aren't a lot of examples out there and we're also interested in how um there how the relate what the relationship between relational values and empathy might be here are my references uh I'm really grateful to my sponsors, the Vermont Alliance for Half Earth, uh, especially Kurt Lindbergh, who's who's leading that. Um, I'd like to say thank you to my academic committee, Michelle Gold and Bob Zano and John Erickson, all of my research participants, and so many other people who have who have helped me and supported me along the way. <laughs>